Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Among Equals podcast. I'm here, OG Lani Lakitsal, here to welcome you, and I am here with Kenya and Cody. How are you today? Wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, the reason I actually have you is because I see you just working really hard on the music and seeing you guys, Subsuelo specifically, you guys just seem to be in such a great groove with all the stuff that you're doing, and I wanted to check in and see how things are going for you. Um, and the music scene. Yeah, things are nice. Uh, you know, coming out of a, a winter hibernation, we yeah, um, yeah. you know we slow down a little bit during the winter, and uh, you know we're a collective of ten. And during the summer, we spend a lot of time together. I know. And a lot of time I see that. Kind of focus on <laughs> Subsuelo, and during the winter is a time when we all kind of crawl Do into our thing. little caves, and you know it's an opportunity to kind of decompress. And um, yeah, right now is feeling like it's just that that takeoff time for for 2020. How long have you been, if people don't know, how long have you been actually DJing, uh, I guess more, it's just all in LA. Yeah, I mean, I know you go other places as well, but how long have you been doing this for? Uh, I guess I bought my first turntables when I was 18, um, mm -hmm. when I was a freshman in college, and I'm 36 now, so just crossed the halfway point in my life of doing, you know, I've been a DJ longer than I wasn't a DJ. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah, and pretty quickly when I was started DJing, I was you know I was DJing three four nights a week in college, really really quick. The I went to college in Boston, and oh really? One of the great things about Boston is because it's such a college town, the turnover is so fast that there's a lot of opportunity for new people. Totally. Um, you know, in other cities, you kind of like the the um, you know established heads kind of hold down the, the spots. Floor. Totally. And you have to earn your way up really slowly. Um, but in Boston every year, you know, people graduate and leave and so there's new opportunities. So it was a really good place for me to kind of be able to just like baptism by fire thrown in there. And I love doing it. That's, that's my way. Yeah. <laughs> I love the baptism by fire. What made you uh, realize that that's something you wanted to do? Because back then, mm -hmm. sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but back then, I mean, we're not that old, but still, mm -hmm. I think at that time, DJs weren't as prevalent as they are now. I think that, I mean, back then you were doing records. Yes, it was a lot more heavy lifting. It was a lot of heavy lifting. On public lifting. transportation. I was, yeah. I was taking turntables and crates of vinyl probably, in the rain. In the rain. On a dolly to the train and then taking the train. On to, a dolly to yeah. the train. That must have been a sight. Yeah, it was. So um, cool. Yeah, it started, I mean, I think that when I think about like when did my DJing start is when I realized that like what the buttons on the car radio did and on the way to kindergarten, I remember just kind of like, funny? you know, like Obsessed being able to, to switch stations and, um, and then in high school, I would just notice that you know, everybody took responsibility for different things in a community. Some people, when we would gather, would kind of like organize the food, and other people were like the cleanup people, and other people were you were the like, music person. And I was just kind of the person who would choose to put the music on, and yeah. um, you know, you try and you get in where you fit in, kind of thing. And it was just a kind of natural, um, kind of where my natural attention went to. Um, and then, you know, I was really lucky because I was. Uh, you know, 13, 14 years old when Napster came out. Yeah. And up until that point, I was saving up my allowance to maybe be able to buy one CD a month. Wow. You know, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, yeah, eighth grade, yeah, yeah. where it was like, you know, eighteen ninety nine for a CD. Totally. Um, and then Napster came out and I just went crazy with it. Um, yeah. I'm a collector. I have that kind of like baseball card little kid like comic book collector mentality Me where too. I just like to like have it you know get everything and so when Napster came out I was just like all right I want every hip-hop album ever and just like really diligently so, went through it and yeah. built this like ginormous collection of mp3s which I still DJ on. I mean, I had to replace a lot of them because a lot of them were 128 back in the day, but yeah. a lot of them somehow weren't even. And so every once in a while now I'm DJing and I'll look at the metadata for the file and it'll be like 1998. Like <laughs> I've had this MP3 for 22 years or something that's like so that. Neat. Um, Dang, that's and then got super into vinyl and then in college it was a way to, you know, make money and, yeah. um, uh, what did you go to school for? Uh, international studies, um, oh. focused on immigration, um, Whoa. and um, have always kind of looked at music through the lens of um, people more than music itself. Uh, I studied ethnomusicology um, 
uh, in my Fulbright after uh, for like my my post grad stuff, and that was always way more interesting to me than than musicology. I mean, music is really music is great, but to me, what is much more um, meaningful is the the kind of communities around music and the mm -hmm. you know the way that it affects people and um, you know the the notes and the sounds in a vacuum to me are are is kind of less interesting than than you know how did music become in part of people's lives and uh you know and who are those people and what are their their those lives how did you that's amazing because you say that and i feel like now this uh this group of people that have come together sort of represent what you you were kind of focused on back then right just sort of that idea of yeah like, i mean there were the certainly culture and reflecting world music and there was certainly a, um, a rupture point for me where I was um, really keeping my different parts of my identity separate growing up. You know, I was listening to uh, hip hop with my friends yeah, yeah. and I was listening to rock with like my mom and her friends. Okay, yeah. And then I was listening to Cuban music with my grandparents who I was very close with and spent a lot of time and with. And you're Cuban, correct? Yeah, my mom came from Cuba in the 70s and then I was the first person in that family born here in the States. Um, and, but I just, I really kept all those things very separate during adolescence. I think we do that though. And then at I one point everything. it's like, like why? Why? Yeah. 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 Like, why are we doing this? This is all of me. Mm -hmm. This is not a part of me. And it was, and it was music that really helped me to, to do that. It was, you know, it was Ozo Motley. They were really yeah. one of the first yeah. people that really kind of like opened up my mind that, you know, there's a way that I could, um, uh, you like know, because, translated. yeah, just kind of like be whole. Um, and um, the Orishas album that came oh out my also God. really Orisha changed my, changed amazing. my, you know, the Orishas really... was amazing. Their music videos back then, yeah. do you remember? Oh my God, and it was like on the box mm -hmm. and it was on, it was all, yeah, it was all on the <laughs> yeah, underground stations. Yeah, yeah. Like, LATV when it was like back, back in the day, LATV. I used to, I used to, uh, I used to work at LATV. I was a record, I used to be, cause I, were, I went to the music school in North Hollywood, mm. the recording school, mm -hmm. LA recording school. And I had to do hours after for my internship. So I worked at LATV for a summer when it was banging, when it was like mixed to the max. And it was like, and it was, it was, it was all the rock and espanol bands were coming through and i was working the call center to try to to try to call people to come to our shows <laughs> it's just crazy yeah. and it was all it was exciting that was an exciting time that was a really cool boy two max was always there yeah. um yeah and when they were that was when they I think they had pangea had come out mm. um and it was it was just a mexican descent was really big mm. it was that was a good time you're right. It was like I just compl you completely took me there. I'm like, whoa, my mind got. I totally forgot it when it worked at LATV. They had all that mariachi hip hop, mm -hmm. like mashup stuff. Mm -hmm. They had Control Machete, yeah. and they had all the rock. You know, with it was just it was a really good time. The only thing I wasn't feeling was when um, Cypress Hill did the, like the rock rap stuff. I was not a fan. <laughs> That's my least was, favorite, like Calle 13, uh, too. I love. Oh, no, Gaetres is one of my but, favorite ones, but the fourth album, I think it was, I, or the fifth well, album, you know, the one like that was, they, like, super yeah, rock, rocky, and it's just yeah, kind of like, right, dude, I, get, yeah. I get they're being experimental or whatever, but sometimes, I think I went to, um, what's it called, the, not Up in Smoke, the Smoke Out, the Smoke Out, yeah. and I was so excited because I hadn't seen Cypress Hill before, and I grew up on Cypress yeah. Hill, OG, first albums, everything. And I went, and all they did was that rock, all the rock shit, and I yeah. was so pissed off. I was yeah. like, I, I don't want to hear this. I really try to give <sighs> artists like permission to do things yeah, that I don't too. like. Um, but it is sometimes. <laughs> but very like, you want to hear Temples of Boom? Like, you gotta <laughs> hear hits from the Bond. Like, there's some stuff that you really yeah. gotta like. That's like your staple. <laughs> Anyway, to get back to it, yeah. So, so yeah, so music really helped me growing up just try to kind of like piece my identity together and, and seeing people like Eric Vogel, you know, yeah, who yeah. was so comfortable yeah. inside of like straight up jazz and Latin jazz and then also He's in amazing. like, you know, Beastie Boys and, yeah. and Cypress Hill and being able to kind of like not think of yourself as two-faced, but just having, you know, multiple, multiple sides, sides, you know? Um, and And then... So then I kind of like circled back. At first it was like using music to kind of understand, you know, how I came to be and who I am. And then it was, um, 
like studying how immigration has um, led to those fusion uh, of music, you know, yeah. those experiences, and, and it wasn't just um, you know randomly that this sort of fusion music that I like came about. It came about as the result of of people moving and interacting with each other, and you know what were the the politics and economics behind and the that, pain. and the pain and the stories and the, and the human stories behind the music became as interesting to me as the, as the music itself. Um, and so that's what led, so then I went to Spain and was studying the connection between um, Arab music and flamenco um, in Spain and uh, was there for three years uh, studying how, how immigration affects rhythmic change and how, you know, the evolution uh, of music, um, you know, can't be told without the story of immigration. Absolutely. Um, they just go hand in hand in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And like what we were talking about, kind of the emotion and the reasons why these things are created and you know, the suffering and the pain. I mean, uh, most of our, and we've, I've said this before, it's like most of my favorite music comes from the pain mm -hmm. of what people have gone through and the mm -hmm. struggles. And I think that a lot of the artists that we, you know, like the more popular artists that everyone kind of knows, um, everyone loves, they live through the music of the pain of the, mm -hmm. the sorrows of whatever is going on. So knowing, because you said your mom, your mom got here in the 70s, right? Yep. So making that connection, was that something that, like, did you feel as a child, did you, were you disconnected a lot from sort of your family roots being here? Or did you feel, how did you feel here? I thought everybody in Los Angeles was Cuban because we hung out with a little Cuban crew. And so there was when, a little community yeah, here. a little community here. And oh, so like, and then like when we would go to the Glendale Galleria, there'd be a lot of strangers walking around. Uh, and then we'd run into somebody who we knew oh, who was it. Cuban. And so I just figured all the strangers I didn't know were also Cuban, but we just didn't know them. It really wasn't until it. like... <laughs> when you're a kid though, like you just have these you, you're very like one dimensional. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. thinking. You're like just like if you run into your teacher or something back in the day at like this market. You're like, you're at the market. <laughs> you shop. Like I know, isn't that funny? It's so funny because I, I used to work with kids a lot more, and then if, I, if they see me outside of work, God forbid, I was like, Miss mm -hmm. Lonnie, what are you doing at Trader Joe's? I'm just like, I'm getting stuff from. I thought you were at school. I'm like, no, I'm not. I don't live there, dude. Yeah. Like it's so cute. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So so yeah. So I, I kind of in the in the you know elementary school era when yeah. I didn't have an identity outside of the family it was very yeah. kind of Cuban centric um, and um, yeah I, I never I never met my father so I didn't know that side of my family at all so you're full Cuban though no I'm, I'm my father's American okay and I never met him so okay. I so kind of I grew up in a, in a you know 100% Cuban got it cultural context and your grandparents were here too and my grandparents, yeah, my, my, my mom was a child when she came. Oh, she got was, it. She was 10. Got it. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, and so uh, it was then, you know, in, it was really through sports and hip hop that I kind of like forged my identity away from my yeah. family, you know, totally. and, and kind of like, yeah. you know, there's that period that I feel like a lot of um, the members of Subsuelo and a lot of people who are kind of in our world went through that period where they kind of pushed away mm -hmm. their background, totally. either partly because of kind of like internalized racism yeah. and partly out of just kind of typical typical are. teenage rebellion mm -hmm. stuff, you know, and then you kind of like reassimilate all, everything um, you know, so in, your, in your adulthood. Um, but... You know, one of the difficult things for me, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately because of, of Bernie and, um, you know, the, the election, everything, yeah. is that um, one of the, the major kind of like adulting moments in my life was trying to reconcile my personal ethics and politics with the Cuban community and my older generation grandparents' community's yeah. position on things because the Cuban American community tends to be very conservative and very yeah. right wing. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, as you're growing up, you tend to kind of just take the positions of your family until at one point you have enough kind of experiences and, and perspective to and kind of. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I was. 17 graduated high school i wanted you know i was having trouble because all of these um all of these writers that i was you know reading and all this this history that i was reading and the politics um were telling me a different story than i was hearing from um the people who um you know had yeah. raised me and um 
like just dra like they Drastic were talking about different, different realities, you yeah. know. And so I wanted to to go to Cuba when I was seventeen and just kind of like figure this out for myself. And it was a. Um, Are you? Was, I'm sorry. You an only child? Uh, my little brother was born when I was eleven. Okay, so I got I got a little half. Half, yeah, half, yeah, half, half an only child life. And I just wonder because you have such an independent, the way that you're fi like floating through the atmosphere, <laughs> it, it, it was like, you not that you must be an only child, but you just have a very independent sense of thinking. Yeah. That sometimes I, it's harder when people actually have siblings. Have and, that. And yeah. Like I, that. I, I was so, blessed yeah. with, um, you know, my, my real young childhood was like very like multi-family yeah. um we had like multi-family dinners and just kind of like babysat by the tias and just kind That's of like dope. super community and then um my mom and i moved to ojai which is a couple hours north of los angeles mm -hmm. um and then it was just me and her and there was no family That's there and she was working she was the esl teacher at the school at my okay. school and she taught she did she was like the after school program so i had the like two o'clock to six o'clock oh, free wow and that was really when my like independent street got to like wow. and, and it was like a, it's a real small town so it's a real safe community and so i could just like and that's when i really started just like hopping buses and exploring things oh, and cool. just doing that and then that that really dominated the next like 10 years of my life was like travel and exploration um when i was 17 i spent two months in cuba on my own um and then how did you feel <laughs> that's a well, we, we can get into that that's, okay. a, that's a large uh, many things okay. <laughs> um awesome. but one of the things it was the first country that i had ever spent first latin american first third world country whatever, yes that i had spent time in okay. um and so i was having trouble disentangling how much of what i see here is because of communism yeah. or whatever or and how much of it is just poverty and yeah. Latin American poverty in the nature yeah. of that and mm -hmm. so um after I left Cuba so this I took a year off between high school and, and college this is when I was 17 um and so then I went to Panama and spent six months traveling from Panama to Mexico City to try and get some like yeah, bearings some on yeah, you know what is yeah what is or like balance and yeah. figuring out you know yeah absolutely um and that and that really helped a lot and then when I was in college I was studying I was studying immigration, and I also had a, had a concentration on, on post-communist transition, and okay. so I was studying Eastern Europe a lot, and okay. so then I went and spent a summer traveling in Poland and Yugoslavia. Damn, Cody's and, on fire. <laughs> I love this. Um, and all, almost all of this, I yeah. figured out how to do with uh, with grant writing. Um, I was going to ask you. Wait, yeah, how, just, just asking rich people for money doing? has generally kind of wow. worked. <laughs> I mean, and a lot of what we've done at Subsuelo has really only been possible because of, of funding, you know, like so many of our ideas, the market would never support it, you I'm, know? I'm sorry. I'm going to be, I'm going to ask you a real question about that. How did you have that mindset to feel like that was something you were worthy of asking for? That's something I don't really have um, a great answer for. I mean, I was supported with a lot of love growing up okay. um, and I've always been pretty good at school type things okay. and so i got a lot of validation from from okay. teachers and and stuff got but it. um I, you know I, what i mean yeah but I, I know so many people who have you know all the same or if not greater abilities than i do and love oh yeah it's never about but the they talent. like you know it's they don't never have about the that, talent that they don't thing. have what you that it's a it's a it's a low i call it a low frequency confidence mm. because you don't you're very humble when i see you you are present and you feel very in, like you're in the music and you're really there, but you're not like bling bling, look at me vibe. I mean, you're a great dresser. You do have a style, <laughs> but, but you're not like obnoxious P. Diddy music yeah. video. Yeah. Like, so when you say that, I, and, I, and I call that low frequency, when people are annoyed by you, you're not an obnoxious person, it's like, look at me, but you are creating an experience. And when you say that you traveled all over and that you've asked for this, I feel like at least in our community, there's a like we said there's a lot of very talented people but they don't know how to mobilize it yeah. and like how do you say it in english Armat? like how yeah. to arm yeah. how to arm yourself mm -hmm. to like make it happen for you and make yeah. that universal shift to it coming you're receiving it because you've asked for it yeah. and you are you feel worthy of, of yeah. it i mean obviously i've enjoyed the advantages of looking white and yeah. being male yeah and so that oh, gave yeah. me some like stepping stones along the way and then did you know that before 
No, I, I, well, I mean, I wasn't aware of that until I was like 16 yeah. or something like that, right around, right around yeah, the time yeah, that yeah. Kind of my general political consciousness started growing. But that really happened because I um, applied for a scholarship to go to a private high school in my town um, that was wow. really progressive and just gave me a phenomenal education. Wow. And it was, it was, um, I mean, the, the academics of it are, are like super top notch. I really, I, I felt, well, I, I learned how to read and write um, on a more competent level and a more like thoughtful, profound and nuanced level in high school than anything that I saw in college. I, I really got a, an awesome education, but the education was balanced with um, outdoor skills. Every student had a horse and we had to spend um, the first week and the last week of every school year um, on an outdoor backpacking trip where we learned outdoor survival skills and we That's lived so and that sort of like communing with nature has oh, always yeah. been a really important part of like me trying to get out of my head because we can just be so you know so brain heavy yeah we are um, and wow. mm, but it was a really expensive school to go to. I mean, the school yeah. cost more money than my than my family made in a yeah. year. Um, yeah. And so I met a lot of rich people. Yeah, and so true. I got to see how they do things. And the thing about rich people is they don't pay for things either. They get yeah, grants, yeah. they get free yeah. stuff. You know, like yeah, the richer yeah. you are, the more free stuff you get, yeah, you the less stuff. taxes you pay, the more cars. And so I, yeah. I, I got to study a lot of rich, how, how rich people did things, yeah. you know? And then you just kind of, you kind of fake it, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's rich people thinking, rich mm -hmm. people thought mindset, yeah. poor people thinking, poor people mm -hmm. mindset, and we all kind of stay within our lanes. And it's really hard, that's why I think it's awesome and props that you bring that up, because I think it's hard for people. That's what makes you sort of more progressive and dynamic, is that you learn how to go into new lanes. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to do that. So yeah, so you are telling me, so you were traveling. So, so, so yeah, so traveling, travel? so kind of got to see a lot of things, and then... Um, how long were you traveling for at that point? So I did a full year of traveling uh, between high school and college that okay. was like really slow. Um, it was backpacking. It was backpacking. Like hostels. Hostels, okay. yeah, like small buses. And right. Spending about a month in each country in Central America. And then um, then in, in all of my summers in college, I was doing international trips. I spent a lot of time in Jamaica, a lot of time in Morocco and Eastern Europe. Um, and usually like trying to do something like one of the things in Eastern Europe I was doing was studying academic freedom and so specifically libraries. And so I went and interviewed librarians about what has changed in post-communist transition about academic freedom. And then was interviewing librarians in Cuba about, you know, what are your limitations? And then trying to, and this, all of this tried to helped me get a, a perspective on freedom that is a little more complicated than we have it and they don't that freedom is options. And one of the first times that it really clicked with me was, was actually about noise, that in Cuba, you have the freedom to make noise. You do. And in America, Music's you have everywhere. the freedom to peace and quiet, yeah. you know? And that that's a value choice, that really inherently there's nothing, there's nothing wrong. wrong about either, either of them, mm -hmm. you know? But here you can call the police on that's your neighbors so if they're being loud and they have, they have a, 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 an so expectation, you know? and. For me, I romanticized Cuba. I was like, there's mm -hmm. just music in the street. And everywhere I go, I'm like, walking yeah. to the rhythm. Yeah, but a lot of Cubans who are, you know, nurses who need to wake up at six in the morning oh, hate it, you yeah. know, and, and wish that they could live yeah. in America where you could yeah. call it, you know. And so, yeah, it has to, uh, that, that um, trip. you know, that there isn't, and getting, getting over this sort of, like, better or worse um, concept mm -hmm. uh, and more just kind of, like, values and priorities, you know? Yeah. What sort of life do you, do you want? Um, and, uh, and so that really helped me get this, you know, the idea of, you know, is, uh, when I was looking at, at academic freedom and intellectual freedom and kind of free speech, you know, that generally we tend to think of like, you know, free speech is better and then the oppression in Cuba is bad. Um, but it's tied into, um, uh, being able to, uh, literacy, you know, yeah. would you rather have the ability to read anything you want, but only a small percentage of people have know the like to know how to do it, or have, have everybody access. being able to read, you know, or yeah. and then no one's reading, and then no one, yeah, and then no one, no one <laughs> or um, yeah, you know what what happened with with AIDS in Cuba, I think, is such a fascinating example of of uh, how it, these things are just complicated and values based. Um, you know, when 
um, you know, one of the greatest successes of the Cuban Revolution was the elimination of, of prostitution as like a yep. pervasive um, oh. part of, of Cuban society, which, um, uh, and then um, at the collapse of the Soviet Union um, and the kind of lack of funding in Cuba yeah. and then opening up to tourism, prostitution came back. Yeah. And then um, that's how um, AIDS began in like the late 80s to kind of appear in Cuba. And uh, the policy in America was to kind of just like ignore it and yeah. let people die. Yeah, and then label it like, <laughs> yeah. oh, it's the gay. Yeah, it's the, it's the gays. Um, whereas in Cuba, what they did was mandatory testing of every single person in the country, wow. and then if you were tested positive, you, something happened. Now, how you describe what happened to you will reveal a lot about what your perspective on Cuban politics is. You yeah. can either say that these people were imprisoned or you can say that they were um, quarantined. quarantined and given, um, yeah. they were given top quality care, um, care. care, but they yeah. also were, they weren't given a choice in the matter. Yeah, and, they you were know, just taken and dealt Dealt with. Dealt with, yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, what What would you would you rather have a society that allowed people to independently make yeah. their decisions I mean, with their family? Mob, it's a very or... mobbish way, though, like, we're just going to take care yeah. of this, you know? Um, and so, yeah, traveling um, has, has given me that opportunity to try to get a little bit more nuance on, on thought of things. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there also are some things that are, like, not nuanced, which is just, like, the music in Cuba is just so much <laughs> better than everywhere else because they the allow um, their, uh, not allow, they empower their musicians to practice and yeah. to work on it. Whereas almost all of the musicians that I know are um, either have day jobs yeah, and don't have the time to practice, or they are spending, if they are full-time musicians, they're spending most of their time like marketing themselves yeah, and trying to find work and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a struggle. Rather than you you spend more money trying to be a musician than actually make any sort of money being yeah. a musician usually. <laughs> like the amount of gear you have to get and the you know you have to get a studio and it, I mean you don't have to yeah. but I mean here it's sort of you're right and then you go there and it's just like everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's just everywhere. It's in restaurants, it's on the streets, it's just there it's just flowing. And you're right. It's it's so encouraged, and they just everybody's so freaking talented over there, like so talented. But I'm like mind blown. Through out. training and a difference of um, expectation of when in your life you're expected to be your best. Here, I feel like there's this expectation that we're supposed to be, be the best musicians at like. 20 years old, 22 years old or yeah, something, you know? And it's like, that's true. you know, that makes sense maybe for athletes, maybe not even, but still, like, well, like maybe makes sense. But in Cuba, it's like 50, 60 yeah. is when you really hit, like, that's true. your stride. Your stride. Absolutely. And I feel like I'm still, like, uh, learning my craft. And there are, there's this thing, like, well, if you haven't made it by now, maybe you should just give up. Yeah, it's very hard. You know? And it's like, right. what are you talking about? That, that's I'm still learning this. It's a 10,000 hour rule, though. Yeah. You know, if you haven't done it for 10,000 hours, you're not mastering mm -hmm. yet. I mean, mm -hmm. the Beatles, if you, if you look back at everybody, all the amount of hours that they actually put in before they got yeah. famous and actually made it, it's well over 10,000 hours. And they say, like, you have to do lo minimo mm -hmm. 10,000 hours. Oh, and, that's, and that's what I really like about Subsuelo and, and was one of the sh major shifts that happened about halfway through Subsuelo was that, you know, at first we did, we were kind of progressing along the what path. Was, I'm sorry, what was the intention of Subsuelo originally? Because I'm sure that that has... It was a house party of friends okay. where we could play music that no... Uh, you were buddy would it. pay us to pay, to play it, just you know? You wanted, right? Yeah, like, like I, I was DJing, I was already DJing, you know, like st some straight Latin nights where I was just, you know, playing cumbia and, mm -hmm. and that was fun and I was playing some straight hip-hop nights, but no venues were wanted me to play like, like Sonora Dinamita and Tupac like next to combo. each other, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was house parties. Um, and then the other major intention for me, I mean, Everybody in Subsuelo had their own motivations and yeah. intentions, yeah, and that yeah. was one of the great things about it, so I can't really speak on everyone's, but for me, a big part of it was that I wanted to give flamenco a context to exist in Los Angeles that was not um, sit-down theaters or restaurants. Like El Cid. I love El Cid. Mm -hmm. It's great. 
but it's very formal. Mm -hmm. You sit there, you watch. It's beautiful. But yeah, like like just to see it throughout, just organically at different like different bars or I, yes. And, so, and yeah, that was what I always saw. You know, and this has always been something that I have trouble with with you know when music gets a little too legit you know and it tries to turn into like yeah. this you know yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah, like exactly this music is not that you know like what happened to jazz you yeah. know and and what i saw in spain as what flamenco was for a certain when i came here it just felt so it felt like i was in a in a museum you know yeah. um and yeah. so a context for that that was a big part of it for me um so you the flamenco part was that would you say when did that fusion come into play with subsuelo from the from day one yeah. and so you all were together and someone said hey we should formulate this thing um, well, so i was living in spain recording i recorded a flamenco album in spain oh. um and was studying for my full time you, what, you record were you recording i was the producer and engineer yeah oh, that's cool um and I need to hear that. Was really like living <laughs> inside of, 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 that um, world? of that world. Okay. Um, and then I came back to Los Angeles temporarily to work on um, the uh, soundtrack for a film that was about the flamenco scene in Los Angeles. Oh, cool. And um, when working on that film, I met um, Cristina La Tigresa, who um, was one of the... Um, uh, producers of the film mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she is one of the five co-founders yeah. original co-founders of Subsuelo mm -hmm. um, and so our first Subsuelo was us playing global bass and um, you know her and the, the crew during doing a flamenco performance and so yeah flamenco has been fundamental to Subsuelo from from before it had a name wow that's amazing so uh, so after you were working on sorry you were working on this album and then what happened I just, I, I had a, um, a pretty prejudiced view of Los Angeles. I had this view of LA that it was like Hollywood and superficial mm -hmm. and that the real music was happening in, you know, other countries or maybe New York or San Francisco just or LA. just not LA. Yeah. And so I really yeah, just I didn't, it. I didn't even really consider living here as, as a oh, possibility. Same. Yeah. And then I was here for a couple of months and, um, through Afrofunky, which was the party that Jeremy Soul did, yeah. um, I met uh, Farah and Josh, who are two of the other co-founders of Subsuelo, mm -hmm. and got connected into this kind of world scene. music scene in Los Angeles. And then I was living in Boyle Heights and um, just started to realize that there was something really special kind of on the outskirts of what people think of as LA and that you know LA is a lot more diverse and interesting than I was giving it credit for and yeah. fell in love you know literally and um to, with the community and uh, have been here since um that's so funny mm -hmm. um because my company is West Coast Burroughs mm -hmm. and the reason it's West Coast Burroughs is because I love I respect the East Coast so much because it's just New York boroughs mm -hmm. just reminds me of all the different uh, communities that are very, they, they all have their own independent uh, characters mm -hmm. and, and just qualities and, and culture. And so I wanted to say West Coast boroughs because I wanted people that know what's up to recognize that we, just like them, yeah. have little boroughs mm -hmm. and that we all have different characteristics. And like you said, it's not just Hollywood. It's not just so like I based everything that you just defined <laughs> based was based on my understanding of the outskirts of understanding that L.A. is beyond. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I'm probably guilty of being a little bit too like like stay in my own little borough in Los Angeles. I could take advantage of Los Angeles a lot better. Me I too. Really do not. I love Koreatown and I don't I don't fucks with it. Hard. <laughs> Every time I say it, that I'm is about gonna... the edge of where I would, you know. Like, yeah, and like, like and, I you know, know, and you're right. But see, there's only so much like we said That's earlier true, that, that we, we can, can take. Like you work so hard, you're out all the time. You're out in the world. And I also think about like um, Nicodemus is one of my favorite DJs, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and uh, he he says that his grandma hasn't left Queens in like 48 <laughs> years because she's like, what? They got better dry cleaners in Brooklyn. They got a better. They got a better. Yeah, like you know, like everything yeah. I got, everything I need I'm is here. here. You know, here. I feel satisfied inside of my community, and yeah. and that was a major shift for me. I was really like in my in my you know before this chunk of time, the last 10 years. Years that I've been in LA I was just constantly trying to go to like new and different places and explore and now I feel much more 
excited about like just going deeper and like being more rooted and kind of like and knowing lots of different little parts of I a agree. smaller space than like just running around really trying cool. to see that's everything. That's true. I guess I feel that same way. And it kind of like uh, um, was in parallel with another kind of perspective shift that happened was that you know when we started Subsuelo it was, it was just a house party and then it got to the point where like you know we were having 200 people in a small house and yeah it wasn't it wasn't gonna it's which, too much you know <laughs> cops come in though to be honest the cops in Boyle Heights were always awesome they would come to the house at like three in the morning and there'd be 200 people there and they would be like all right half of these people need to leave <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah. and a lot of a lot of times they went to high school with a lot of the people who were oh at the party gosh. and so they'd be like hollering at girls like getting that kicked out of the party so like y'all get off of me <laughs> um <laughs> But I kind of got I got sick of stuff getting stolen and people throwing oh up in my, my bathroom God. and all that stuff. So then so then we went to Eastside Love. Oh yeah, which yeah. Is just down the block. That's and where so, I saw you guys. That's so that's where, where I saw we started. Ethos. Yeah, I saw and that's where I saw Fleming. I mm -hmm. saw her dancing. God, God Eastside Love. Um, and we still do our anniversary there every year. Yeah. Um, and and then we got to the point where there was like more people in line than could were inside. inside. And so then we went to Los Globos, which is like double the size. Yeah, and yeah, we yeah. were doing stuff there. And then, you know, we kind of be able to fill that out. So then it was like, all right, let's do That's a so big cool. show at El Rey and try and get bigger. But as we were trying to do bigger things, we, I realized that it, it required more and more compromise. Um, in terms of booking mm -hmm. and marketing, yeah, you know, to yeah. appeal to a broader audience, we started having to kind of make sacrifices and yeah. things, and it was a, it became a lot more administrative and a lot less creative. Mm -hmm. And so the there fun was a, starts going away. Yeah, and so there was a point <laughs> where I kind of was just like, you know, would I rather be successful or, or happy? And what and, you know, what makes me quality. happy? Yeah. And Word. um and I realized that you know I really like performing and I like small crowds. I like regular intimate connection with people. I like knowing the people who come to our parties. Um, and I like being able to have the freedom to fail, which you don't have the you know when things get too big, it's scary. You know, like yeah. I might lose you know, 10 grand on this show. Whereas now if I do something and messes up, it's like, all right, maybe I was at a hundred bucks, a hundred bucks yeah, or whatever, yeah. but, um, Freedom and so, awesome. yeah, rather than doing like, trying to do one big yeah. thousand person show every two months, we just scaled it back. Don't and, like, you think though that comes with wisdom and age? Yeah, that is what, because it definitely Because you don't care that. anymore. Yeah, you know, like, you're, you're, you're like, I want to be the biggest yes. and the baddest. And then at some point you're like, nah, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> So now we just do it a lot. I mean, we did Subswello three days a week last year, which was probably too much. I also learned that that was too much. This year, we're going to tone it down a little bit and keep it to like like twice twice a week, maybe. Yeah, um, you guys are busy, man. <laughs> I'm like, I see, I'm like, I wish I could like visit as much. So having a, having a, t a network is so awesome. Yeah, um, You know, good. just yeah, like, sure. I, you know, we have... You know, having um, Farah to help with not only photo, but no, I know with, what she does with booking. Yeah, she's because really good. you know I get stuck in my own world a little bit because I'm DJing. It tends to be that like you know I'm either like at home resting, yeah, and, per, and like practicing, Energy. preparing, downloading, or I'm at my own events. So I don't really get um, that kind of broad perspective on the whole scene as much as I used to, and as much as Farah does, because Farah is out shooting stuff everywhere all the she time, and so she's, she's always everywhere. introducing me to like new artists and she's letting amazing. me know, you know, artists maybe that I was aware of, like yeah. they're gotten a lot bigger, they got a lot better, you yeah, know. Yeah. Dude, I had to have her on first. Yeah, she's awesome. Like I think because I feel like um, she's woman. And for me, that was important mm -hmm. to see somebody grinding so hard as a female and she's small. Mm -hmm. And I, we talked about that, about like the challenges of just being like a small female mm -hmm. within the environment and trying to work through like even like physically shooting something and trying to be at an angle and cleverly having to climb up on something or having to like make it work. Yeah. And then that is so amazing. And then on top of that, I think just the amount of she's kind of the back end stuff that she said she kind of works on mm -hmm. and does and i just i and because she's the photographer mm -hmm. 
she's behind the lens and I wanted to talk to someone who was behind the lens and actually give that person the light mm. so for other mm. photographers and people to see like look how hard someone mm. eats she probably didn't like it very it. much did she, she, <laughs> she I love her though she did it she did it yeah it's an easy way yeah. yeah you want to make fair mad lucky. take a photo of her <laughs> yeah I did and you know but you know she shared mm. so she shared a few and I knew then that means that she was mm -hmm. she felt like it was a, she it was love so then like with Julian as well, you know, Julian was somebody who, um, you know, when we, when we first started Subsuelo, yeah. I would just like put weird DVDs on the projector uh, at Eastside Love. <laughs> just like throw it up. Just like weird stuff. Yeah. I remember like, weird old stuff. old Russ Meyer it. videos. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah like, cool. Um, gun thief lesson stuff. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then he would... Uh, point he would come to the parties and he would point out like hey the you know the menu screen is on you got to press play again because so the, the videos are only yeah, two hours he's a worker and so then eventually I was it. just like hey if you see that happen you can just like push, it. push play and then uh, and then he was like you know I kind of want to do this thing and, and I was like awesome that would be great and now he does like so much more than just the visuals for us I mean a similar thing with Farah you know somebody initially comes in with kind of a narrow focus and then you realize that they have like a All diversity of interests and abilities and and sometimes they're not even skill sets sometimes it's just interest and then we give them the context to be able to develop that interest That's and so kind cool. of a motive because it's hard to to do the work to learn things when you don't get a kind of regular reward for being able to kind of do the thing that you're you learning, you know? Yeah, and that's so true. you like, you know, you can spend a lot of time practicing to do visuals at home and stuff, but unless you get a lot of chances to do it, it's kind of, you know, you yeah. kind of run out of steam. So now, you know, Julian, um, you know, is somebody who started as kind of a visuals person, but now is doing all of our merch. And he's the person who does our like screen printing stuff. And, you know, he got us our Subswello slip mats. And, uh, you know, and then in terms of like certain people are really good at, um, you know, organization of cables, which I'm horrible at. And he's good at I like keeping at track of, of logistics stuff. And that's wonderful. And yeah, I'm just, I'm really grateful i see a lot of people in los angeles and just all over just working so hard um on their own yeah. because it's you know it's hard to build community and it's hard to meet like-minded people and i think there's some especially just in kind of like the capitalist system there's this sort of like expectation that you have to like individually make it and yep. like individual success is what is prioritized and it's just exhausting you're absolutely right it is like that that individualized like I I always see the us versus them vibe mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's always like me against this, you know, and it's as it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. That's not the reality yeah. of everything. You know, we're not against other people. We're not against like if we all work together and we ask for help. No one likes to ask for help. Yeah. So because you've created this like safe haven of people who just work together and you trust each other, then there's just it just organically comes. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Most people are very much about themselves. Because they feel like they can't really like reach out. I mean, it was super hard for us. It definitely we went through yeah, a lot of growing pains. I was gonna ask you things. like what are the, what were like it the biggest difficult. challenges? It's like the Wu Tang. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, <laughs> you know? the biggest challenge for me was was letting go of control. You yeah. know, because do you, like, do you think you're, are you a controlling person? Um, I have strong opinions, uh, especially <laughs> yeah. uh, about um, aesthetics. Okay. Um, and and about procedure, I, I have. Uh, um, you know, yeah, often I, my instinct is to solve a problem in a way that makes sense with my brain. And then because I can explain why it's the best mm -hmm. with my logic, I can, I feel as though it's right, but like, there's a lot of different types of logic and it's taken me a long time. And nothing is always right. Yeah, like, there's, there's no right way. Um, yeah. and, and so, yeah, like there's a better way. Sometimes. <laughs> just kind of like allowing myself to be outvoted. Um, mm. It was something that once I let that go, yeah. just so many things got better. Do you found that? Did you find that more empowering at that point? Uh, I don't like, know if it you... was more empowering, but it was freeing. Yes. And the results proved to be more effective. Okay. Um, so that's that was what you you've taken from that. It. That certainly, yeah. Letting go of control and letting go of knowing of thinking yes. that I was right and kind of just like, uh. yeah. <laughs> That, like that, the moment. that has certainly been, been a part of it. And I then also like that, so. trying to learn how to um, harness your competitive spirit while also recognizing that you're part of an ecosystem and like there's an there's a abundance of success out there. And so, you know, we, we came up in a lane that was not particularly um, 
uh, busy when we started doing yeah. what we were doing. Yeah. You know, there was definitely, you know, Afrofunky and Bodega, and there were yeah, some scenes there were scenes, that were, but it wasn't, were doing it. Yeah. Um, but, um, but, and that was at the beginning, and they, and they definitely, and, and Mustache Mondays really influenced us as well. Okay. Um, uh, Mustache Mondays. Where was Mustache Mondays? Was it La Cita? I mean, it's been in a lot of different places. It's like oh. one of the, it's one of the only kind of like East Side gay parties that oh, does no, okay, like. Oh no, okay, that's why I guess I wasn't in the like in the gay scene a lot at that point. Yeah, it's one right? of the. Um, yeah, they. But they, they're so liberal, you know. Like in in certain, the gay scene's always like always like in the leading. They're always so free in the music. I, I don't know, just always, yeah. always. They always drop the new joints. They're all about the free open music a lot more. Sometimes I think. I think sometimes they pave the way a lot more with music, like yeah. EDM and house and stuff like they'll play stuff before anyone else is playing Absolutely. stuff too. You know, I think it's just the way, the freedom of just like letting loose and not being inhibited. It's just it, it's there. I mean, know? part of it is the consequences that when um, the when the dominant society provides no context for you, yes. you have to make Creative your own. Context. And so yeah. the necessity yeah, yeah. of that is what leads to that creativity. Yep. You know, yep. you don't just get to just like have everything pre-made for you you know yeah. you have to actually do you have to make the party that is absolutely true which is something that i really think about as subswell at all i mean it gets a little cliche but i really think of the the crowd in subswellow as being one of the performers and being like a voting member of some of subswellow and yeah. that like when subswellow doesn't work is when we go into neighborhoods or when we book people who attract a crowd who come to be entertained rather they than just watch yeah they just watch they're, they're waiting for the party to start whereas like the oh party my gosh, you right. you are the party you know like if you, i am you the have party. to yeah it's <laughs> the crowd that has to make it you yeah, know I agree. like there's a response not a responsibility but you want to be that yeah you just are that actually mm -hmm. you don't want to be it but you're right it was people that just show up and go my friends aren't here yet yeah. like this is dead mm -hmm. there isn't 25 people here yet yeah. like let's go like you're right, and that's that is so true. So, so yeah, you, there was there was a couple of parties that were that were similar in in our lane that then, really inspired us. Okay. Um, it, but then after like two or three years, a lot of you know bodega ended, yeah. Afro funky ended, mm -hmm. um, and so then there was it like a middle off. ground where we were one of the only parties in LA that were kind of doing that that global based fusion scene, yeah. and it was right at like peak EDM. Okay. when everybody was kind of going yeah, that, that way. way and and um uh then you know we're in this reggaeton resurgence right now oh, I guess. where every five minutes there's a new perreo party in la and there is a yeah, there's, there's a temptation for me to get you know uh possessive and mm -hmm. resentful mm -hmm. uh and to just mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. catch myself in like, that and it, in here. you know and just let it go like you uh, know it's it's better for me for there to be more successful this. parties in my genre I see to that. build I a, a scene in a community that's vibrant rather than trying to like hoard and protect it you know so, sorry random off we we'll get back on the path but you know like the first at least the first reggaeton like the when it hit you know like evie queen mm -hmm. and, like all that yeah um were you rocking all that already at that point? Uh, I had the hardest time. Yeah, with I did that. too. I was, I was like, it didn't, it I was didn't... like, like boom bap hip hop, like progressive okay, yeah, yeah. rap lane at I that was, point. I was dub club. I was dub oh, music, okay. dub plates. Yeah. I was, I was all there. Yeah, and I was I like immortal it. technique. Like that I was, there is, too. that was my lane. I was there right before that. And so anything that I, I think that I was because I get bored. I might. I was judgmental music. of reggaeton Me as too. being superficial. Me too. Um, whereas now, in retrospect, I think that I was missing the point I in a lot of ways. At that point, I don't know that there was a there's a I, reggaeton can be seen as kind of trashy mm -hmm. and like you know low low mm -hmm. what was it low shelf low bar low grade. Um, and the original, when I used to hear it, I remember it just felt like it was kind of a trashy yeah. music scene. And, and I was, it was always in, and I was always in the, I was in the hood. Back then I was kicking it in the hood and that's all, like the Paisas were playing. Mm. And I love Paisas. Like they're my people. I'm, but I think back then it was like, I, it just didn't, it didn't. Yeah, I didn't connect with yeah. it. Yeah, I, I I try to be careful now because everything that I hated back in the day, I, I come around and realize yeah, I later that I even like, okay, when I know? was working at LAT, <laughs> when I was doing that, there were groups that were coming in and I didn't have the ear. I wasn't ready to hear it. I've talked about this in other podcasts. Or just I brought up the Beach Boys. I hated the mm. Beach Boys. When I was growing up, because it was surfing USA, yeah. and it was just like that. I love the Beach Boys now. Like I love yeah. the Beach Boys now. 
because it's it's you hear the the intonations and the harmonies and I, it, you just the only for me it was Talking Heads. I oh, thought Talking really? Heads was so lame. <laughs> it just reminded me of like my mom's dorky friends. Isn't that you know? funny? And I was yeah. like, oh my god. And I, I just looked at, at David Byrne. He's so like awkward, and I was like, this guy's a <laughs> nerd. <laughs> and then so now I'm just like, oh my isn't lord, they were so like, yeah. <gasps> And and so oh, you know one of the first things that really helped me with a lot of stuff was just realizing everything is not for me. Yeah. And then the step after that is everything is not for me right now. Right. You know, just because I don't like something, the moment, just like you know, let it be. It's like food when you open up your palate. Because mm. like you know, ten years ago there were foods that I didn't, I wasn't interested in eating, and you just keep trying and keep trying it, and one day you may your palate yeah. may open up and yeah. you're just more open to hear it. I also feel like. Um, experiences are connected to music, connected to food. So, like, I've known mm. people that say, I I hate this. And then I'll say, why do you hate it? Well, we were fighting and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. This song was playing. Mm -hmm. And so they connect the music with the emotion. So then they throw away that away. Mm -hmm. Or the other way. I never heard this before. And I was in love. And then this song came on. Now it's my favorite album. I mean, so much of the music that we play is um, motivated by, by those emotional memories yes. and nostalgia. Yes. Um, yes. You know, nostalgia is a big part of what we do and yet I really am opposed to um, that, that the kind of museum nostalgia element. I and I, I you that. know, it's all That's about like including like nostalgia, but modernizing it, adding your new level to it. I agree with that. I think for me, I have a hard time because I've, I've, I have a DJ's world mind. I just, I'm ready to hear new music because mm -hmm. I don't want to hear the same music over and over. Yeah. And it's just, yeah. I try not to roll my eyes when I go somewhere and I love so many DJs, but like, and, I, and that's why I never chose to be like a DJ like mm -hmm. professionally because I just never wanted to do the same the music same over and over. I just, yeah, I, I know. Do. It's it like gets a hard. nightmare. I know. I, 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 and that must be, that must be, you know what I mean? It's like you get locked in like a coffin your own yeah like you gotta break out of it but like you can't because then these people want to hear what they want to hear i'm always amazed when i go to like particularly like reggae and hip-hop have this sort of just dude like... i know i can't even <laughs> I, I can't go to i you can't know? go to that many events and shows anymore yeah. it's gotta and i love be... that era and i love that music but i i and i've been dude, hold know. on i've been going to brain feeder mm -hmm. uh the highland park yeah. uh at um eta mm -hmm. and it's all like it's all new stuff yeah. and, it, and they're just live yeah. jive Drum, drumming and, and it's like I gotta hear the new stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't hear the like old Yeah. I, unless it's underground. Like if they're playing some stuff yeah. that I haven't heard in a quadrillion years, mm -hmm. then if you know, then I'm like all hyped. Yeah. But if you know you're playing so my, Batman's my, or something. My compromise in there has yeah. been global bass, which allows you to have kind of the um some of the sounds uh, of nostalgic oh, music yes. and yet but present it with like new rhythmic patterns um, adding new frequencies you know it tends to be so that for you that's kind of how it's it can be both because there is something just profoundly emotional about music that reminds you of, of your past yeah. and your family yeah. and your you know yeah. all these yeah. things and I so agree with that. so have, you know an opportunity to kind of have both in there has been uh, you know I also think about it in like kind of like an environmentalist way is that if you just like you gotta you gotta keep planting trees. You can't just keep picking, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, like adding new sounds to something, uh, something is going to need. give something for the next generation Absolutely. to sample and to make. You know, yeah. like yeah, we have to. We, I we, agree with that. I used to be. I I went through my phases probably like in the early twenties where I was all mad about it because mm -hmm. I realized that everything's been sampled. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, when you first hear something, you think. That's the first time you've heard it, so you think it's yeah. new. Yeah. And then you get you realize after experience, like you know, you have uh, the experience of knowing the music. Then you'll hear a, a drum beat or a kick beat or something. You'll be like, "Oh my god, that is like, that's old." Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I this know. whole time, I thought I was, I thought I was hearing something new. And yeah, I mean, we all we all experience the history backwards. You know, it's we like do, right. <laughs> I mean, you're right. We all do that. Like we we all read the books, history books. I mean, whatever. I remember when I. I, when I discovered Fela Kuti, I was like, <laughs> oh, my oh my god, god look yeah. what I found! And I was always late. I mean, he was dead, you know? Yeah, and I was like, oh my god. And I went around telling people 
about it, you know? And some of them didn't know about it and they appreciated that. And that's, you know, that's how you learn things. And it's good to share what you learn. But some people kind of like, you know, yeah. laughed at me. And, and now that I'm a little bit more age, I, I see younger people discover things yeah. and you tell me it. about it like it's new. And it's like, it's cute. you know, it's, it's cute. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, cute. so wait, so I need to go back with you because you brought up hip hop so much. So because you're so freaking interesting. <laughs> You're so cool. I'm so glad you're here. Um, hip hop. So what? After you know what we're talking about, like the rep, like the repetitive vibe of hip hop. Sometimes, what is your favorite artist now? Right uh, now. Right now. Right uh, now. Earth Gang. Earth Gang. Earth Gang. Earth Gang is amazing. I mean, the the best thing and the worst thing that you can say about them okay. is that they sound like modern outcast. Oh, it's a, I don't know Earth Gang. They're amazing. It's, okay. you know, you're going to listen to the album on repeat okay. for a week. Um, you know, okay. rapper duo from uh, Atlanta. Atlanta. They are like... You know, some South, hood, Happy some South, hood gangster weirdo oh, hippie, all right. like alternative, oh, very South black, cast. like just yeah, like yeah. really no. musically adventurous, clever and funny, vulgar and profound. Just like what and I like, like from the, yes, what I like from hip hop. All right, yeah, they're great. Um, I like Young Thug's album last year. I like Young yeah, Thug. Young yeah, Thug yeah, yeah, okay, Young okay. Thug got cool stuff. I mean, uh, I. I, I certainly have a um, an inclination towards like kind of West Coast hip hop, and okay. so the artists that uh, I have I have certain artists who I like a lot more than they are good. Okay. okay. <laughs> you know, like Sage the Gemini. I oh, love yeah, Sage yeah. the Gemini <laughs> a lot. You know, like more it. than he probably deserves. <laughs> well, it's a vibe. Then. Yeah, like, it's a vibe. It's a vibe. Yeah. It's like it's a swag mm -hmm. that you probably appreciate, and yeah. I think that is a lot of hip hop. Yeah. What about What's your classic old school makes you feel good in your heart hip hop? Tupac. I mean, Tupac changed my life more than more than anyone else. Tupac was the first time that I empathized with somebody who I didn't know. Mm. Um, you know, until then I cared about my community. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and, you know, and in my community, I was probably, I was far more aware of like Latino issues and like gay issues because I knew those people. But growing up in my community, I didn't know a lot of African Americans. And so I didn't have that sort of like- the like, black story. Yeah, I didn't have that sort of like empathetic connection. And yeah. then listening to his music- He's and, highly emotional. I mean, yeah. He's, he's, a, he's a theater, he's a thespian. Yeah. If everyone doesn't know, he's a thespian mm -hmm. that knew how to rap. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing emo. I struggled with Tupac because I found he was a bit too thespian. Yeah, just rigidity of thought. You know, this is, I would say the, the biggest change that has happened in my life over the past, you know, 10 years or whatever is just learning to be more flexible with my ideas and to be more open to being wrong. And, you know, I was, I was a very stubborn young man and just okay. thought I was right. And in retrospect, you know, whether it is the, you know, the uh, talking heads thing or different political thoughts that I had or anything, just kind of like realizing that, you know, um, there's a lot more nuance than uh, you're probably capable of grasping and that there's a lot of different perspectives. I mean, even just when it comes to being in a relationship, um, I... Uh, will think that I am right so hard with my partner and then realize that it's not that I was wrong but that there's just a different way to think about certain things than the way that I was thinking about them and even that the, the two ideas can be opposing and both true at the same time Absolutely. you know it took me a long time to get there not that long actually <laughs> I mean I, I, I just think it's amazing I think you have a really open and broad sense of the way that you're thinking I I'm kind of where I, where you're at right now, where um, I feel like it's easier to just accept uh, information mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. uh, suddenly put uh, a label on it and think something about someone or make some sort of conclusion because my mind ultimately wants to make sense of something. And based on my experiences, my emotions, my trauma, whatever the fuck I went through, suddenly I want to label something. So it's like, okay, this is what it is. And just yeah. like put it in a box. Yeah. And I think it's really hard to keep it fluid and keep it like, it's just what it is. It has nothing to do with me. And I'm trying to be a better, this, that's what I love about this podcast. It's just like, I want to be a better listener. Mm. I just want to be an active listener. I want to hear what people have to say. And I want to be able to like, 
take some of that in as wisdom so that I can better negotiate and like work through my life because that's all we're doing. Yeah. And it's, it's how we requires see. commuting. And yes. that's just the thing that to get back to like, you know, the individualism of capitalism is that it's just, it tries to isolate all of us yes. through. And, and I feel like, like, um, you know, Uber and Lyft and food delivery and all that stuff. It's all just more isolating Amazon, all of us, Amazon you know, Prime, Amazon, Amazon Prime, Prime and yeah. all of this is Netflix, just like trying everything. to make us all in our own self-sufficient. Yes. Uh, and self-sufficient when it's, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, when we're, which is when totally we're, fake. First when of all. we're commute, when we need community, mm -hmm. when we thrive as a, as, as human humanity needs other people to, to live. Mm -hmm. They have, I mean, there's people who die when someone else dies. Couples have been yeah. together for years. Yeah. The, the wife will die and the husband will die like a week later mm -hmm. because it's like and and not to say that that's always the way it is but it's like you need to have purpose in your life mm -hmm. and if your purpose is to be by yourself isolated you're gonna die that's just this is like yeah. for sure and i and this whole and i struggle with this because i'm very feminine and blah, blah, blah. it's like the memes and the like you know when i was younger it's like self listening to a lot of self-help mm -hmm. and wanting to understand more about myself but understanding that sometimes that stuff isolates you too because it tells you that like you're you should be on your own and yeah. independent you should always be strong and you need to be able to function without any other opinions like you need to just be strong within yourself and that's hard yeah to like do that all the time no one can do that all the mm -hmm. time and that's why there's all these people that are you know really struggling and on the verge of like suicide and i mean bourdain like yeah. that one hit me so hard because i'm just like he had it all you think like you look at his whole life and he got paid to travel he just seemed like such a lovely person and he's well traveled and has a child and every it's just heartbreaking when you see stuff like that you're like wow it, it really does touch on everybody yeah you know yeah i felt like i i spent a couple decades learning how to be self-sufficient and independent and then as soon as I got there then I was like oh now I have to learn how to be vulnerable and open, <laughs> and open to another human being you know and that's actually the the, the that's work the, that is the work because mm -hmm. it's easy for you to get into a routine for me I'm yeah. very independent mm -hmm. it's like wow to have to share time with somebody it's mm -hmm. like I already have my own thing going on and I think that's the, the hardest part of even going into you know you're with somebody but I'm single it's like going into that those waters I'm yeah. like I'm I'm good yeah. Sometimes I struggle with it, but sometimes it's like, most of the time it's like, wow, I can come home, I can do whatever mm -hmm. I want. I can call, I can make, do this, I can go f make food. I don't have to ask, you know, what this other person's thinking or how they're feeling. And that is such a struggle. I mean, mm -hmm. for people that are in relationships, I give it to them because I'm like, wow, that, that does take a whole other. I'm in a new r relationship right now, which is fascinating. We're co-parenting our neighbor's dog. <laughs> <laughs> because our neighbor uh, got a job and they're gone during the day all the time yeah. now and we're home during the day yeah, and yeah. so they needed us to help kind of like once they were going to be going out of town it's and so we asked to help once and and it was like they were so apologetic like oh I'm sorry and and we loved it it was great for us and then it kind of turned into a more long-term thing where we watch them during the day yeah, and he yeah. goes home during the nighttime and it just it feels so normal and natural this is how communities used to raise children you know and it's how i remember being raised growing up i mean i had a very unique background i love your the background that you i i wish we all had this yeah i i i mean i had two i had it from two sides one i had it from the like kind of latino side where it, it tends to be more community raising absolutely it's funny we went um my my uh grandma likes to get uh food from this one korean bakery and so we always go in there and, and get food for her and the um woman who works there a korean woman um asked me the other day um she was like are you white and I was like, um, um we're Cuban. Right? You're like, I'm Cuban. Uh... <laughs> and she was like, oh, I knew it must have been something because white people don't take care of their grandparents. <laughs> oh, 
full burn that you know. Yeah. yeah, it's very But But um, yeah, there is like, you know, so already like yeah, the Latino yeah, community totally. has more kind of family community yeah, thing going. Yeah, you have to take care. Yeah, we don't have a choice. Yeah, I know. Choice. We can't afford to put her in no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they're like, no, you're taking care. Yeah. There's no question. Um, it's like, what are you going to do when I'm retired? Yeah. <laughs> totally. I'm babysit my grandkids. <laughs> exactly. Um, or my dog. Yeah, yeah. Or my neighbor's dog. <laughs> but then I also got it from like kind of the hippie side. Um, and I did get, get to see kind of like a positive community white person scene um, in Ojai where there is kind of like a, um, you know, very connected to the earth and um, yeah. community side. And so when I was growing up, we did, we had five families um, that we would rotate dinner at each other's houses. Oh, and so one day a week, it was your job to cook for this everybody. massive meal for five families. And then oh my gosh, you would, so we would go over and there were kind of similar age kids and stuff like that. And it just seems so reasonable to me. And it just does not exist. Um, it doesn't. So I'm just like, wow, that's like my mood. Yeah, it doesn't exist. Like, I, I think the the way that everyone's sectioned off here, because mm -hmm. like I kind of know my neighbors, but no, like it's just unless you go across the street or make those sort of connections here, it's not like we have a community block party. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also um, because people are working different hours. Yeah. People, some people here can't afford to have a day off yeah. and do a block party. Um, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like the money and everything. Like, it just, like, yeah. this whole area is just like, I, don't, I love, I love this neighborhood. I, it's beautiful. It is, right? One of my favorite thinkers about music, his name is Wayne Marshall. Um, mm -hmm. He, uh, he actually um, co-wrote the, the book on reggaeton that's called Reggaeton that, like, if you take a, a class in it in college. Wow. He's an ethnomusicologist. Um, but, uh, he one of his his quotes is um, the cliche is that um, good fences build good neighbors. That's like one of the cliche, and then he was like, "Good parties build good neighbors." Yes. You know? Oh my gosh, good fences build yeah. good neighbors. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's like the it's like one of those like American cliches. Yeah, that's good a very American. Yeah, that's a very that's very telling. Yeah. That's crazy because I'm building a new fence. It's <laughs> But it's all like, you know, it's falling apart. But anyways, um, so let me ask you this. Um, I'm so glad you're here. I learned so yeah, much Yeah, it's right been now. lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think you're here first among equals because I, I've been seeing you. Actually, before I do this, my last, one of my last questions is, you're such an academic um, and you're so cerebral. Not to say that the music scene isn't like that because most of the music heads that I respect and admire really have thought very intensely about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like a whole nightlife scene. Yeah. And I feel like you are like me. We can do the nightlife scene, but like, I feel like you are a very morning, aware, awake person. Is that a, is that some sort of, do you struggle with that at all? Or are you used to it or? Yeah, I think that, that I'm, I'm balance. I'm... I'm grateful that I am not stuck in uh, having to choose to be one thing. That was one of the things that I had never liked about academia was that it was just so, it right. was very kind of like, it's very kind of gangy. Like you got to be all in or all out, you know, that That's if true. any, like the academics who do, um, who publish anything for general public are like looked down upon, you know, like you're supposed to be writing really complicated, incomprehensible texts that are, get published in academic journals yeah. and, and you're not supposed to. I almost see you as a professor, man. Like I'm just like. I, I do. I do. I like. Uh, I like communal learning, so I guess that's, you know. Is that where school. I'm getting that? School, I just think so, that, like, yeah, yeah I, like I just feel like, yeah. Um, but Sorry, I, yeah. yeah, I like uh, the idea that, you know, we, we all contain multitudes. And, we do. You know, that you can be, One um, thing and you know, you else. can be a, like, super... Um, black nationalist and also love worldwide wrestling you know like you don't have to, your whole identity doesn't need to that. like fit into this thing mm -hmm. and yeah having the freedom for me to go like shake my ass at some uh, warehouse at four in the morning and then also you know have you found Amy Goodman and... yeah exactly <laughs> have you found uh I mean this is I feel like this is always such a cheesy thing but like a balance in that do you find? I mean, it's a struggle every day to kind of find a balance. I would say it's more of a it's more of a pendulum. Balance are you a morning person or a, what, uh, no? I am an I'm a, I'm a night person. Okay, cool. So yeah. it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> I 
that's what I guess that's. No, I'm a night person. Okay. Um, I'm also a napper, so like, oh, geez, so like I last night I, I went to bed at napper. what three in the morning, and then I woke up this morning at six thirty, and I've been up since six thirty. But I will go home after this and take a nap, and then I'm gonna go DJ and be up till late tonight. Um, That's awesome. But um, the uh, we went off. The, the, yes, <laughs> the, about, about balance. To me, balance balance reeks of of um, still like uh, uh, not one. moving. Mm. And to me, it's more of True. a pendulum thing that I go through these periods in my life where I am what um, season, and, and I think of it as kind of seasonal as we well. Are, we are, we are, we are definitely. We, I don't think that we all understand how much the seasons really do impact. It's for real, yeah. yeah. No, Ooh, I wild out way more animals. during certain sections yeah, of you're summer. Yeah, right. I and... do wild out, wild out yeah. way more. You know, and then wilding out is coming. Yeah. Yeah, while that ooh, is ooh. coming. And then it goes a little too far and you start to feel oh, a little yeah. and then you pull it back. Gotta while in. Gotta while, while in. <laughs> while, in. <laughs> while in. Totally. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. So let's get back. Sorry. So um So taking inventory is an important part for me, is like cause you can get caught in cycles and habits and then you can just keep going out late all the time because that's who the people who reach out to you are and you know and it just feels and so like just you know journaling and doing therapy and things that cause you to kind of take a step back from your life and yeah yeah and see you know what have i been doing lately what areas of my life are deficient and then kind of like course correcting and then going too far that way and recourse correcting and <sighs> course correcting man <laughs> yeah. i'm getting better at it yeah I think before I don't know maybe I just had no idea that there was a correction. <laughs> yeah, it's just like fuck. What was what happened? Yeah. <laughs> what did just we do? accepting that you're not gonna like get to a good place and then be there. Oh, it's yes. just not gonna happen. Yeah, and and what is a good place? Yeah, <laughs> you know, so just keep going. Just keep and, going. And, you know, yeah. If there's something like drastically wrong, yeah. then there are times for those sort of well, that, And then that's the yeah. reflection yeah. and doing the work. And But I think the older you get, the more that you see what needs to be corrected mm -hmm. through patterns and experiences in your life. You're yeah. like, I've been here you before. suffer consequences, Why you learn lessons. You <laughs> and you get tired of it. And it's weird. Yeah. And, and you know what, I, I miss the days of like naivete mm -hmm. when I used to be like, I don't know, that was no. just so fun. Yeah, recklessness was fun. It was so fun. Yeah. I loved being in denial, I think. Now I'm like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I see denial. I still will make bad decisions, but I'm fully aware of the consequences of and them. And we're doing, we're like, know? all right, second, we, know, we know what tomorrow yeah. brings. Yeah. <laughs> I know, that is so true. So, so, okay, so here we are. So you're here because I think you, you, you just, you're just amazing. Like I, I don't even, I didn't even realize how amazing you were until we actually sat down on this conversation. I've just been um, fangirling on you for a minute at Subswello and all the events. And I see online all the stuff you're doing and I just see all the work that you're doing. I guess what I want to say is like, what would you say to people that want to do things that are similar to what you're doing? Like what, what is it that you're, the message that you're, maybe not you're trying, but like, what do you believe in? What is it you're trying to convey to the, the world? Um, in your actions, find your... like-minded people who share similar values and interests to you, and team up with them, and work together with them, and support them, even if it doesn't have any direct result on you, and it will come back to you. Um, everything that I have accomplished in Subswello is a result of a team effort, and um, being able to um, like think of yourself as part of a group is just the most rewarding feeling and it's you know we used to have it in church and we used to have it in whatever it used to be back in the day and i'm glad that it's not that anymore i don't even know that i'm glad but it is not that anymore for and us. so for us yeah and so yeah. um you know and especially because of social media it's so easy to feel quasi connected you know, I just through likes and comments, but like, that's not really. actually invest in other human beings and team up and have have communal goals and work together towards like communal goals. And I absolutely I can connect with that because I'm always looking for a team. Mm -hmm. The key is my team. Mm -hmm. And I, he's an amazing, he was all in 
when I said we need to do yeah, this. It's great. And it's really hard to find people who are all in about stuff mm -hmm. when you when it's a project based. And you know what? This is a project for you guys. Mm -hmm. This is a long term, amazing, yeah. beautiful project that you are sharing with the community and the world. And it's such a beautiful thing. And I, I'm so grateful for you coming here. And, thank you. I'm so and, grateful for this as well. It's and thank you for and, and thank you for all the hours that you put in to make all these people happy in our in our community and. I hope that people really take a lot from this because you've given so much right now from It's been a labor of love. I know. <laughs> and I see it. So thank you so much for thank coming you. to First Among Equals. Do you have anything that you would like to plug? This is probably going to come out in a few weeks, but maybe people can follow you or... Yeah. Um, Subswello Crew uh, is uh, our handle on all the different social media. And we're coming up on our nine-year anniversary, Woo! which is going to be in May. And we're celebrating it with a week-long celebration Whoa. in mid-May. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Last year, we did eight parties in eight days. This year, we're pumping the brakes a little bit yeah. and not doing nine parties in nine days. But um, it is uh, the week that our Subswello Sundays parties start, which is the week after Mother's Day. Okay. Um, That's good. Be with your mama. Yeah, be with your mama. Be with then, your mama. Yeah. Uh, and so so it's our first our first Subswello Sunday at Kanye Rumbar. And then we have our uh, anniversary at Eastside Love. Uh, and awesome. then we're playing at Lightning in a Bottle Festival, which oh, is no! always a joy. Really one of my favorite festivals I've ever been to. <laughs> And then we have our 11 hour party for Memorial Day that weekend. Whoa. It's a crazy week. I'm also, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the official, uh, I'm marrying two of my closest friends, <gasps> like in between those two parties. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, Are you like officially? I'm going to get ordained. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to get ordained. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to do it right after this. Yes, yeah, is... I'm on my way to go do that right now. That is amazing. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Uh, and then, team. yeah, and then we're going to do, so our one little numerology thing we're going to do is we're going to do a nine hour live stream from the Subswello Studios live DJing, um, thing there. So for anybody who's not in Los Angeles, that's an opportunity that's to amazing. bring everybody in. So that's all mid-May. Okay. May is popping. Yeah. And then after that, it's all Subswello. Yep. Subswello, Subswello every Subswello Sunday, Mark. um, every <clears throat> Sunday all summer. All right, cool. And then your handle? Uh, El Cañonazo. El Cañonazo Okay, cool. Spanish is a little complicated. Oh, yeah. I love Anya. I live for Anya's. I know. That's like one of my favorite things ever. Um, I, awesome. Well, thank you so much thank for coming. You. And thank you guys for checking out First Among Equals. Please check him out. We are so grateful to have you and have a great rest of your day. Thank Thanks. you both.